I'm absolutely flabbergasted. I think it's beautiful. And as a proud mother, of course, I'm very pleased with it. It's really nice. It's a very beautiful It's a case. very good, uh, very good full thing. Uh, me as a patient, I'm, I'm happy. It shows the connection of human and God. So I'm, a, I'm privileged for it being in my church. After all the turmoil and hard work, the final result is absolutely wonderful. We're seeing the purity of the creation by God of us as human beings. Fleur and Leo painted one scene, covering 12 square meters. Michelangelo painted nine main scenes, and in total, covered more than 500 square meters. He finally unveiled the ceiling to the Pope on the 31st of October, 1512. The Pope proved a hard man to please. At first, the Pope said he was pleased, said he liked it. Then he changed his mind, said he wanted changes, more ultramarine, more flecks of gold. It looks poor without gold, he said. So I said to him, the people depicted in this painting, they are poor too, struggling, suffering. But you wouldn't know about that, would you? I'm not going to change it. Not a single detail. If he doesn't know perfection when he sees it, and now, after all my struggling and suffering, there's not the sign of a single duck as he owes me as a bonus. But history would judge the ceiling differently. It was to become one of the world's greatest treasures. Fleur and Leo have come to the Vatican to see the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Fleur has seen it before, but this is the first time for Leo. I can't believe this. I just want to... What we've done. I just want to reach out and touch it. Tremble in wonder. Yes. I've seen this a thousand times in books. And there's no book will ever do justice to it. <laughs> the, the, the quality. The quality of the tones and the colours. The quantity is absolutely staggering. Michelangelo, my old son, <laughs> you're one hell of a hard act to follow. A very hard act to follow. As one artist to another, I have to say. <laughs> Do say, some beating. Michelangelo was only 37. He had created a vision of heaven on earth. Yet he still yearned for more. He would one day return to the Sistine Chapel to conclude the biblical story with a final, extraordinary painting. Within months of the ceiling being completed, Pope Julius II died. It was the end of an era. Michelangelo had lost his greatest critic and his greatest patron. But he could, at last, resume work on the Pope's tomb a job which had been postponed eight years earlier. So once again, I embarked on the tragedy of the tomb. And it worked out just as unhappily as before. Worse, in fact. More difficulties, more disappointments, more anxieties. Because of the malice certain men. It brought disgrace. It will follow me to my grave. But in 1513, Michelangelo approached the tomb with vigor. He had big ambitions for the colossal monument covered with statues. He comes back to Florence and he begins working on four or more statues simultaneously and this was common for Michelangelo never to do one and finish one work but to constantly work simultaneously on many of them and we begin to see the sense of his energy and almost fury in attacking the marble as he once again has the opportunity to become a sculptor.
people and you can see the chunks of marble coming off of this and he creates one of these slaves or captives intended to garland the lower story of the Julius tomb, one of 40 original figures. Michelangelo would never finish the slaves. He completed just one statue, the Moses. Time and again he was distracted. The heirs of Julius II were becoming increasingly impatient with him, but the tomb saga would rumble on for another 30 years. In the end, the Pope's heirs had to settle for a much more modest tomb, with the Moses as its centerpiece. One of the tragedies of Michelangelo's life was the fact he never completed the tomb and we're left with that appalling mess. To go from the more than 40 colossal statues originally planned to this wall tomb with one great statue and then a number of other figures carved to Michelangelo's design by his assistant was an amazing humiliation. Julius's heirs wanted to know why they had received so little for their money. I was not paid 16,000 ducats for the tomb. I was perfectly happy to fulfill my obligation, but Julius cancelled the commission. I did finish the amended commission when it was finally renewed, for which I received a mere 3,000 ducats, which was recorded in a certificate drawn up by a notary. Please write this. I will not be remembered as little better than a thief. The records show beyond a shadow of doubt that Michelangelo received 12,000 ducats for the tomb project. At least 9,000 of that was profit. That's more than half a million pounds in today's money. The reason Michelangelo lost interest in the tomb was that he received a more lucrative and prestigious offer. It was a commission which he believed would bring him immortality and it reunited him with his first great patrons, the Medici family. The new Pope, Leo X, was a Medici. He had known Michelangelo when they were growing up together in the Medici Palace 25 years earlier. Now Leo saw a new role for Michelangelo as an architect. He asked him to build an imposing facade for the Medici Church of San Lorenzo in the heart of Florence. It's truly one of the most ambitious projects of all time. The final price agreed on for the facade was 40,000 ducats. This was his most ambitious, his most expensive project ever. It was a facade entirely built out of white Carrara marble. In order to carry out the commission, Michelangelo spent nearly three years in the marble quarries and supervised teams of workers and brought out hundreds of blocks. And in the process, developed rather close relationships with a number of his workers, many of whom we know from wonderful nicknames, the cat, the carrot, Oddball and Stumpy, Lefty, Nero, and the Priest, and my favorite, the Antichrist. And many of these people remained with Michelangelo for years and years, and so we can throw out one of the most obvious myths about Michelangelo, that he always worked alone. In fact, he was an artist who was also an entrepreneur. Then, out of the blue, in 1520, the commission was canceled. After three years of toil, I'm left pissing in the wind. I offered them something which would have been, with God's help, the finest work ever created. And now they say they've run out of money. Send them a bill for my time. The 
bill for the insult to my genius. And a bill. Who painted one scene covering 12 square meters. Michelangelo painted nine main scenes and in total covered more than 500 square meters. He finally unveiled the ceiling to the Pope on the 31st of October. I'm absolutely flabbergasted. I think it's beautiful. And as a proud mother, of course, I'm very pleased with it. It's really nice. It's a very beautiful It's a place. very good, uh, very good thing. Uh, me as a patient, I'm, I'm happy. It shows the connection of human and God, so I'm, a, I'm privileged for it being in my church. After all the turmoil and hard work, the final result is absolutely wonderful. We're seeing the purity of the creation by God of us as human beings. Fleur and Leo, 1512. The Pope proved a hard man to please. At first, the Pope said he was pleased, said he liked it. Then he changed his mind, said he wanted changes, more ultramarine, more flecks of gold. It looks poor without gold, he said. So I said to him, the people depicted in this painting, they are poor too, struggling, suffering. But you wouldn't know about that, would you? I'm not going to change it. Not a single detail. If he doesn't know per